students. Uh, let's get uh, started with lecture. By the way, do you know that what this photo is? Uh, yes. Oh, good one. Nice. Yes, it's football. It's UCF football. It's a few years ago, uh, sudden death, uh, sudden victory. This this was like a Hail Mary pass. And who's that team? South Car East Carolina. And they won this game, and they became champions of the conference. I think that was the first part of their uh, undefeated – or the end of their first undefeated season. So that was pretty good. I forget who that player is, number 11. Anyways, uh, what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to look at question three. And what I've done is pulled the raw data file apart. And, I'll, uh, and, and it, 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 in order to score your guys' papers, it's not, you know, like when we're doing a clicker session in regular class, I can just click on whichever one is right. You've seen me do it a million times. But for the, uh, for the kind of question that we had, I have to pull it apart, the raw data file. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit more about where you define the zero of some potential energy function. And we're going to talk about gravitational potential energy. By the way, that's supposed to be U of R. But parentheses around the letter R on my computer automatically go to the trademark symbol there. So I'll, I'll try to change that somehow on uh, when I put it in YouTube. All right. And we're going to have some homework and work on examples and stuff. But um, uh, we're going to violate this principle here and we're going to go right into the data file and the data file I'm just going to look, let you look at the raw it's XML and it's pretty heinous um, and it's requires major eyeball activity to figure out see there's the actual data right in there and uh, uh, but we're going to – I took all that stuff apart. So, you know, it's basically like walking into Mordor. Uh, but, you know, the thing about Mordor is it can be done. You can walk into Mordor and destroy the ring. So um, let's review the strategy for question three, which was the Area 51 problem. And everybody's graded now. Everybody's got a score on that. Um, this is a solution over here to the left. We'll look at some larger scale versions of that. The main thing that you wanted to do was, uh, as always, in some kind of a ballistic arc, figure out your components of the initial velocity, and then from that, put together the equations of motion. Now, I can tell that a lot of you did that correctly, all right? And, and by the way, the uh, partial credit, uh, that I was able to give you on this was significant. There were some students that got one instead of two. They, they, they didn't have the perfect answer, but I gave them partial credit instead of zero. Uh, some students got two instead of three uh, on other parts. So what you want are these two equations of motion for the two components of the velocity. Now, they're fairly basic. But you can see that the initial components of the initial velocity are integral to both equations of motion. In fact, for Vx of t, it's everything. Once you get that, you're done with that one. But Vy of t, that is time dependent um, because there is such a thing as vertical gravity. And that's a simple one for it. Now, the thing about it is if, if you wanted to do x of t and y of t, yeah, you could do that, but you don't really need it. Uh, in this problem because you don't need the position of that point. Now, if I had asked, well, what position does it turn on? I gave you the time it turned on, the uh, the atmosphere turned on, but if I – and then, then you needed to figure out Vx and Vy at that point in time, but you didn't really have to figure out the position, uh, but you could have if you'd wanted to. So then you – so at time T1, when you, we turn on the atmospheric drag force – using alien technology, you figure out your two components and then in the uh, steepness angle. Now, I mentioned before that 
everybody had um, I, I checked the drop time for all the initial conditions that I gave you. It was 45 degree launch, so it's fairly easy. Um, and so I made sure that the switch time T1 came on uh, at somewhere on the upslope, somewhere on the way up. And I calculated it out. This is form A that we're looking at right now. Um, you also have to calculate the drag force angle, which is basically whatever you get for theta, the tilt angle of the velocity vector at that point, uh, minus 180. So that was pretty easy. And then you had to figure out the magnitude. And the formula for that was in the matching. So, you know, if you got V squared right, you could get uh, the magnitude of the drag force. And then, of course, you had to figure out, uh, mentally figure out the centripetal force component. Uh, and the angle for that is theta minus 90 because it's always perpendicular to the velocity. So, all right, so here's question form A. And up here, this is the velocity at uh, time T1, which uh, I think was, I can't remember. I think this one was 25. I, actually, let me keep going here. Um, so right here, this vertical reference line, this dotted line, that gives you the spatial position at which time the air resistance is turned on. Now, I've plotted out the full parabola, but if the atmospheric uh, pressure turns on at this point, it goes, it, it's perfectly fine. It's a perfectly nice parabolic arc up until that point. But then it's going to dip down a little bit faster. And I got a, a picture of that in a minute. But anyways, that's the time. That's the location right there. And you can get the, you can get that from the um, x of t equation of motion. All right, so there it is right there. And now let me budge these things out of the way here. Now the components uh, of the velocity at time t1 are 556.5 and 311.5. So this rectangle that I just pushed into view, that's a nice big rectangle. And that's approximately the proportion of the velocity vector. So here's the red velocity vector. Now that's a little bit too big for our diagram, uh, but that's the basic shape of it, all right? And I see more and more of you thinking in terms of these rectangles and triangles and stuff like this. Uh, and I think it's a good uh, skill to have in your back, in your tool belt or in your back pocket. All right, so let me, uh, and here's theta down here. Uh, that's the tilt angle above the positive x-axis. Oh, by the way, uh, some of you gave me um, the back angle, the drag angle, uh, in terms of the positive x-axis. So I graded for that as well. I was looking for a negative angle, and many of you put that in. Uh, but I was pretty forgiving. Uh, if, if you just simply had the right magnitude, I'll, I'll give you the points on that. All right, so let's get rid of this. Uh, and here, here it is up here. All right, so that's that's your so 25.0 seconds. Okay, so that's the velocity at 25.0 seconds. This is for form A. Now the um, the centripetal force vector. Uh, is and is uh, we're going to co color it blue. Here it is. Um, its direction is related to the direction of the velocity. Okay, so I'm just going to turn it perpendicular, and all right, so it's going to look something like that. And that is whatever the velocity angle is, 29.2 minus 90. Now the other vector that you had to at least mentally visualizes this one. Uh, this is another little blue force vector, um, and, but it points opposite the velocity. So I just, you know, rotate it around and, and there it is. Okay, so that would be like a kind of a combo diagram. Now, I didn't make any special scale here uh, for the velocity and the force. I made the forces blue and I made the velocity red to indicate that they're two different kinds of vectors. But uh, basically, there's going to be like a T. And the top of the T is tilted at 29.2 if you had form A. 
All right, questions about this? We'll go ahead and look at form B and form C. Any, ah. any questions? All right, so the, the philosophy here is uh, identify um, the time, figure out and visualize the location, uh, figure out the vector, calculate the angle. Here's the, here's the one that we used. And then mentally visualize um, a centripetal force vector that is perpendicular and then a drag force. See, they're all related to whatever you find for V. And unfortunately, that means that if you don't get V's angle right, you don't get anything else right. All right. But it's it's going to be something like that, all right. So um, so similar for form B and C. Here's form B, and again up here I have um, different components because it started with a different uh, initial speed. Um, so it started with 384.7 comma 384.7. By the by the time it gets out here, however, uh, right and this is a little bit further down the parabola down here, um, and that's at about 4,616 4, meters uh, downrange in the X component, um, you, you have components of the velocity vector here, all right? And so basically, um, so here's your point, and you're going to want a tangent line right there. So here's your velocity vector. Um, at that point, and again, you've got, you know, the centripetal force vector, but it's tilted relative to 34.8, all right? And so it's a little bit steeper um, here, and here's the drag force. Uh, so this was a little steeper because it's a little bit earlier relatively on the parabola. Spatially, we're not as, as close to the apogee as the previous one. All right, so so that's form B. If you now, I want to make a note here. Um, s some students wrote for the uh, drag force here. Um, instead of typing in a number, they typed in the word opposite the motion. And so I gave that student full points because that is correct. All right. Now here's the last one. This is form C, tilted at 22.7. So that's a little bit closer to apogee. You know, up here where it's a little flatter, up here. Uh, so uh, there's our, our point, and our velocity is going to be a little bit. Uh, see, I, I, I start out with 286.4 vertically. But by, by this time, I'm down to 119, uh, less than half of the upward velocity. And that shows in the steepness of the curve. So this one's 22.7 above the positive x-axis. And here's the uh, centripetal force again. Uh, here's the drag force again. And, uh, and, but it's basically kind of a T-shaped object. Now, remember... These scales are kind of arbitrary. I just wanted something that's visible. I didn't make any. Uh, I, I could have made a ratio between these two vectors, but I didn't feel like doing it. So, so it's not to scale, but direction-wise, it's righteous. All right. Now, I want to make a commentary uh, on spreadsheeting the true trajectory. So take some notes on this. All right. This is notes for today. And we're going to do some clicking after this. So here's your here's your uh, putative parabola that it would take if it were in a vacuum. But in reality, as soon as you turn on the air here, the air pressure right here, you're going to get something kind of like a droopy uh, curve. Now, it's not going to be a parabola. Okay, because it's not a nice clean uh, 
GT squared, one half GT squared, it's it's messed up and it changes with position. All right. Uh, so you have a landing spot right over here, you know, wherever it happens to be. Now, uh, I was thinking about computing the exact angle for that. And it's, it re requires some spreadsheet work um, and some insight. Now, um, here's a question for you to think about. And, I, you know, I don't know the answer to this, but go ahead and write down this question. Uh, is it possible for you to lose all of the horizontal speed? I mean, maybe not this trajectory, but maybe some other trajectory. In other words, if you lose all your horizontal speed, because you're getting some drag, you're getting some drag force, horizontal drag force. All right. So that drag is like on this part of the trajectory, it's it's a third quadrant vector so it's got a little bit of negative x newtons that means you're cutting it's cutting in on your horizontal velocity so is it possible to lose all your horizontal speed and if it is will this thing just go straight down you know if you lose all the horizontal speed that means you're just doing a straight drop right so is it possible that on maybe not this trajectory but some other trajectory or some other condition on the trajectory that you get a straight vertical drop towards the end or asymptotically toward the end of your, uh, of your arc. And that's a significant thing. I mean, if you're, if you're a, a soldier trying to put a round into a, into a battlefield, you know, if you're trying to, if you're trying to knock out tanks, for instance, you want a, an artillery round to come in from above instead of the front. You don't want it to come in on a horizontal trajectory as much as you do a vertical one because the armor on top is not as thick. Same with a battleship. You know, any kind of a – you know, I watched that movie Battleship over the weekend, a lot, like the last 20 minutes. That was spectacular. Those big guns firing. Oh, my goodness. Anyways, uh, the – the armor plate on a battleship, any kind of a warship, is going to be thinner on top than on the sides. So they're built for in close warfare. Now, here's the thing I want to point out to you. And this is, this is where the spreadsheets come in. Um, you're going to have two sets of calculations. You know, we did one. The, the one that I posted in web courses for you to mess around with, uh, it was a straight drop. It was a, you know, a parachutist type thing, you know, for vertical velocity or for terminal velocity and all that stuff. And you had to figure out why, the VY and delta VY, and then that f feeds into the next line. And then you calculate VY again, and then delta VY from that. And that spreadsheet, I went through that with you guys uh, in class a few lectures ago, a few sessions ago. Uh, but now you got to do two of them. And the thing about it is the, the equation here for v at delta Vx involves results from the y of velocity because um, the size of the force here, you know, if you have Vx and Vy, you square them, you add them together, and then that computes – the uh, drag force, and that sh that's that goes into the acceleration, which is how you calculate these delta V uh, quantities, delta Vx and delta Vy. So these equations are coupled, right? Now, that's a little bit different, you know, like the harmonic oscillator equation that we did, mx double dot equals minus kx. That is easy as a walk in the park relative to this. Right, so this is a tougher calculation, and if you if you f ever feel like I know that you're disappointed by having a full almost a week and a half off from 2048, so if you feel bored during spring vacation, you feel like working on this problem, I might be doing the same thing, and uh, it's it's a but what you know the thing is if you do this if you feel like doing it you should get a trajectory like this. Something like this. And this one, I just kind of made this up by hand. 
um, you know, with the, with the drawing tools and stuff. But you could get an exact or pretty close to exact one here, just as we got a fairly good one for uh, the terminal velocity problem in the y dimension only. All right. So now that would be too hard of a problem for you guys. But if you feel like working on it, um, I'll probably be doing the same thing. All right. So all this, this word, this one word here, anvil, etc. That's where the that's where the headaches are. Figuring out all the stuff that you gotta do in in order to get back to another value of x, another value of y. Uh, but you can do it. It's not that hard. It's kind of tricky. And I you know I've never done it, but I think I might do it over the weekend. All right. Now, uh, last time uh, we talked about. Let me pause this for a second. I want to animate this. Okay, uh, last time we talked about this idea that potential energy is associated with position, or as some people call it, the energy of position. And there's a specific reason that that is handy, calculus-wise, as you'll find in Calculus 3. The problem is that it's defined by in terms of work, and work is a change in the kinetic energy, all right? So the potential, you know, and what we've mentioned before, the change in the kinetic energy is the opposite of the change of potential energy. You know, like in the gravitational field at the surface of the Earth, harmonic oscillator problem, whatever the uh, potential energy loses, the kinetic energy gains, and vice versa. All right. Now, what that means is that if you add in let me get my cursor over here. If you add in a constant to u of x, um, it's not really germane to the dynamics. So, for instance, we had u, u1 of x uh, last time, one-third ax to the third. Remember we did this problem at the start of last? So, and you can calculate u1 of different positions. But this one down here, u2 of x, is the same function except add a constant, u subscript 0. Right? Now, if you do that, you can calculate delta u. All right? So here's, so here's u, u1 of x. So at 1 meter out, it's equal to a over 3. And we did that. And, and actually, this was, uh, I think this was 1 uh, because a was, I gave you a value for a, negative 3 or something like that. And then this one, u, u1 at 2 meters out, is 8a over 3. All right, so this is symbolic. Without, I'm, I'm keeping a on this constant a up here unspecified. All right. Uh, and so we did this in class the other day, and we found out that the delta was uh, 7a over 3, and a was equal to 3, so this was equal to 7 joules of energy. Now, if you go down here to u2 of x, the same function, except add a constant to it, you get u2 of 1, oops, I got an extra parenthesis in there, uh, equal to uh, a over 3 plus whatever u0 was, all right? And u2 of uh, 2 meters out is 8a over 3 plus whatever u0 is, all right? So it's so you, this is basically your results from u1 and add u0 to both, all right? And, but the thing is, when you do the delta of that, uh, delta u2, you still get 7a over 3. And basically, the reason for that is the delta is a difference, d for delta, d for difference. And so um, you're basically subtracting 8a over 3 minus a over 3, and you're subtracting u0 minus u0. So, that, so it, it drops out if you care about the deltas, all right? So what that means for us, and I'm going to go to the next page now, um, the gradients are the same. Delta U1 and delta U2 are the same. Those are your deltas. And, you know, divide that by some distance, and that will be a gradient, all right? So d, d by dx of U1 of x 
is equal to d by dx of u2 of x. So it doesn't matter that 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 u naught gets killed by the d by dx by the differentiation because it's a constant. All right. So those two gradients are the same. Now turn on your clicker and let's do an alphanumeric answer uh, question. And let me switch this over to alphanumeric. Oops. Okay. And this is related uh, to um, this question. Type in a short a word or a short phrase and then hit the send key. What is the dynamical interpretation of the gradient of U of X? What? Oh, let me turn this on. Hold on. All right. Hit your refresh key one more time and you'll have the. Did you see that, that new story about the guy up in Ohio that had like a five foot alligator in his basement? They had, yeah. It looked like an albino alligator too. They, they had, it, it got so big, he had to call somebody to, to take it away. Yeah. What a meathead. He bought it as a, as a, as a pet when it was this big. He put it in his basement, he just kept it there. <laughs> oh, Lord. That's a big one there. That's at least seven feet. I think it was like a golf course not too far from here, where yeah. it was like a these are the stories I like, though, the ones that sneak into your swimming pool or into a school. You know, golf courses, I can see that. That's fairly common. But I see somebody's swimming pool. Or, or one of these uh, black bears that wander down from the national forest. This is going to be gator mating. That's why they do it. They're, they're on the move for mating season. So that's going to be starting up pretty soon if it hasn't already. A few years ago, there was that bear that wandered on campus. Really? Yeah, the, I don't remember that. I don't remember. It was like. This campus? Yeah. Main campus? Yeah. Uh, oh, my goodness. I remember there being a bunch of emails like, be on the lookout for a bear, don't get too close. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, usually bears, black bears are, are not that, you know, bad. I, yeah, I've had a few run-ins with, with black bears. But when I lived out in Montana, you know, that's where they have the bad ones, the grizzly bears. Those are the bad boys. I mean, you can scare away a black bear most of the time, unless it's a mother bear with cubs. And then you just have to head for the hills. But, but a grizz, even unaccompanied by cubs, they can be ornery. But I never, all the time I spent up in the mountains, I never saw a grizz where I was. All right, type in your short phrase or your word and hit the sand key. Let's see what these guys are doing here. Do it again. Hurry up. Derek, what are you doing here? Nice to see you. What's the occasion? This is like inverse to the probability of spring break. So spring break's coming. You better make one more guest appearance. Or... Anyways, nice to see you. Glad you're here. Are you keeping up on YouTube? Uh, Quinn and Tyler, can you make the count, please, count the students? I have 
no idea what this is supposed to mean. Yeah, I'll show you guys all in a minute. Okay, uh, 30 seconds, starting now. Twenty seconds. Seventy-seven. Okay, it's close enough. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Come on, you slackers. Okay, an extra five seconds. Five, four. Three, two, one, zero. All right. Let's take a look at your guys' answers. Let's bring this over here. Um, I have no idea what absorption um, gradient of you is uh, newtons per meter. No, it's uh, joules per meter. All right, so acceleration is not correct. Change, uh, yeah, change, this is, technically, change of potential energy is correct, but, um, and up here, change is technically correct. I'm asking about, you know, del basically delta U over delta X, uh, but sh 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 this is not dynamical, All right? Change in work. Uh, no, it's a change in the potential energy. Change SP. I don't know what that is. Okay, let's go down here. Change in KE. Changes. change of kinetic energy. Uh, this one here, changing kinetic energy would be okay if you had a minus sign in front of it. Conservation or no. Uh, conser conservative or no. Um, that's not correct. It's not just the gradient. It's actually the, you know, what, what tells you about whether it's conservative or not is, you know, finding some closed path and checking the, the uh, potential energy. Constant rate change. I want to see if DEV of PE, direction. I'm going to give that a direction. Drag, no. Energies, no. I try to play. Force. That's, boy, two of you. If you want, take a stand up and take a bow because that's the answer. And it should be negative of the force, but I'm desperate here to give some points. So, Force is equal, no. High, increase, increase, increase A. Increases W equals X. Integral. No. No, no, no. No way, Jose. A gradient and an integral are opposites. They're opposite operators. Not moving one dimension potential. Tangent of the slope. No. Tangent slope. Tangent line slope. Okay. U increases. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of difficulty on this, but let's that means we want to talk about it. All right. 
so um, the gradient d by dx of the of the potential is is equal to the opposite of the net for or the force from that potential. Now let's get back to this additive constant business. Uh, why does having an additive constant matter or not having one? Well, for one thing, it can make your derivations easier. All right. And also it can help you to think physically about the situation that you're in. And the example that we're going to work on now is the uh, gravitational field. All right. And the, um, in the gravitational field, um, your, uh, your force, go ahead and write this down. R is the radial coordinate between centers of mass M1 and M2. So M1 and M2 don't have to be on the X axis. You know, they can be, you know, 47 degrees tilted into the first quadrant or whatever. But there's going to be a line of centers between them. And R is the radial coordinate uh, between the two. All right. Now, G is the gravitational constant. It's like a conversion constant to, to convert a kilogram squared per meter squared into newtons. Right, and it's a pretty important constant. Now, what we're going to do, I want you to take a piece. You know what? We need some scratch paper for everybody. We're going to do some cl a classwork problem uh, that I want to inspect, and I'll be grading it. Uh, can you find a, a bunch of paper to hand out to everybody? Actually, wait a minute. Um, go find some. Uh, take a piece of notebook paper. Um, uh, if you have any, if you don't, we'll get some to you, or you can borrow from a neighbor. Uh, and what I want you to do, we're going to do an integral uh, of this force, all right? And so it's a it's an elementary calculus problem. And this is a classwork to turn in. Everybody turns in their own. But put your group name on the top, as always. All right, work out this integral, please. It's a specific integral. Quinn, what did you do that chair? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Tell you. <laughs> the unknown potentials of my students. Can, can you give me a pencil and a pen? Uh, yeah. There, I forgot to bring my stuff today. You don't look like a tough guy, but I guess <laughs> when the chips are down, in times of danger, I'll call on you if I ever need a bodyguard. All right, thank you. And here's a pencil. Great. Do you want to erase it? Yeah, that's what I'll do. Okay. Thank you. All right, go see it. Anybody need paper? A piece of paper, one person. Yeah, put your name and your group name at the top. And I'll be grading this myself. I'll be eyeballing it. Let's take a look at the uh, solution. Can you switch me over to the doc cam, please? Thank you. Okay. Uh, switch back to computer and then over to doc cam. Okay, switch back to doc cam. There we go. All right. Let's get this. 
squared away. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at this uh, stuff and uh, try to get some insight. into this procedure. Okay. So um, here's the here's the uh, derivative uh, of one over r uh, minus one over r squared. So that's the inverse to the to the integration. So, uh, so u is equal to the integral minus the integral from r0 to r of a bunch of stuff up on top here. Here's the force law, and this is u squared dummy variable du. Uh, and so uh, this is equal to... Um, Uh, GM1 M2 uh, over R uh, evaluated between R and R0. Uh, did I have that right? Did I drop any minus signs? I've got a minus here. Oh, yeah, this should be a U here. All right. All right. So this minus sign is basically what I've got here. So my antiderivative is just one over u. Um, so that's equal to uh, g, I'll park this out in front, times the quantity one over r minus one over r zero. I saw a bunch of people with that. Now I saw some people with logarithms and uh, that's, if we were integrating, one over r dr, uh, or one over u du, uh, then uh, then we get logarithms from that, but we're not integrating that. All right, so let's take a look at this this uh, how this works out. Couple things. We haven't specified anything about the relationship between R0 and R, right? So what I'm going to do is draw a picture of uh, central mass 1, and let me draw a Y or an R axis down this way. So let's say that my object moves between two different positions. Um, oh, so this is number 2. This is number 2. So this is, uh, let's say that this is uh, R0, and let's say that this is R on the R act, or on the U axis, I guess. Um, all right, now let's take a look at this. If, if we start at R0 and go to R, that's like going outwards. So give that a little bit of an outward. So that's the motion that we're getting, all right? Now let's look up here um, at the, the actual quotients. R0 is smaller than um, than R in this alternative. So that means this is a bigger quotient and it's negative. So delta U is going to be negative, all right? Because this is a this is a bigger quotient than this one, and it's being subtracted. So whatever you get, you're going to get a negative number there. Now, does that make sense? You said uh, delta U, but you just wrote a U and then... Yeah, it's delta U. Okay, delta U. 
Does that make sense that you're losing? We've got a sign problem here. Did I drop a sign somewhere? Yeah, this is now the reason I'm 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 worried about this is that if we were to think about this as two two positions near the surface of the earth you'd be gaining potential energy, not losing it as you go out. Isn't R bigger than R naught? R is bigger than R0, that's right. So this question here, no, one over, what? One over R is getting bigger. No, one over R, it, R is getting bigger, but one over R is getting smaller. So this is going to be the smaller number. So let me think. So that means we gotta we gotta drop this minus sign over here. And the reason for that is that in terms of here's the okay, here's the students. We're, we're thinking about the physical meaning of these integration constants in my force. And the gravitational force is always inward. All right. Now, the r hat vector is outward. All right. So I should have in here a minus sign. So that's two minus signs there. That means I still have a minus sign here, and I still have a minus sign here. All right, so we've corrected this. And now this is, let's do it this way, uh, GM1, M2, and let's just reverse the order here, 1 over R0 minus 1 over R. And now it makes sense. Delta U will be positive. All right. You can't just do that. You can just do that. We correct. You know what I was doing? I was going by the uh, something from the book. But this is this is the actual force. And remember, it's actually the vector force dotted into dr. And so the r hat vector is outward, and the the force vector here relative to this. You know, if this is r equals zero down here at, at point one or at object one, then this force is inward because the, the force um, is always toward on the force on number two is always toward uh, number one, which is um, in this way. So that's actually the reason we have to put a minus sign. All right. Now that makes sense. Yeah, right. The, the, the potential energy is always the opposite of the work integral. Okay, so here's opposite of, and then the rest of this is the work integral, no matter how you put your limits. All right. Now, let's do the same thing again on a, an R axis or a U, I guess we could call this a U axis. So this should be the U hat operator. Um, and let's put a couple points. All right. For number two, the force is inward towards one. 
Um, and uh, now let's let's call this R0. Let's give R0 the smaller value and R the bigger value. Okay, so R is greater than R0. All right. Now, you guys ready over there? All right, so this integral now here from R0 to R is, dude, let's do it. Let's, I did, this is a copy of the, the previous one. Let's put R in here and R0 out here so that now R0 is larger than R. All right, so now, from the integral is now, it's still the path from R0 to R, but now we've got an inward. And what happens to something that's falling down from high altitude to low altitude? It's losing potential, it's gaining kinetic. So I better get a delta U negatory here, and, and therefore a delta KE positive, all right? Um, so uh, delta U, let's take a look at it. Uh, 1 over R0 is going to be small, and this, all right, so let's write it down this way. 1 over R0 is smaller than 1 over R. Okay, and so this is going to be delta U here. Now, we don't have any numbers to put in, but it would be a different it would be a negative number of joules, okay? All right, now, all right, so this is with the gravitational, so this is the basics of the gravitational potential energy uh, stuff. Now, I want to do one more physical interpretation for you, all right? So let's do another one. And let's put a squiggle in the R axis. And let's put number two out here at R equal to infinity. All right. And let's put another number two in here. So that's my position R, and we'll call this R0 out here, R0 in the infinite limit. All right, now let's take a look at that. All right, 1 over R0 uh, in the infinite limit, in the, the limit as R0 goes to infinity, this becomes a zip-zap. All right, so 1 over R0 goes to 0. All right. And so your, your potential energy function now, U of R, it's now a function of R, and it's simply um, minus GM1 M2 over R. Um, Uh, plus zero. So this is now. So this means plus uh, a constant equal to zero. All right. So there's your additive constant. All right. Now the physical interpretation of that is the following. If your if your initial position out here R zero is out way way out beyond the solar system, way, way out beyond the Milky Way galaxy, way far away, way far away from any gravity, you know, out to R infinity, out to infinity. Uh, 
do you feel much gravity out there? No, there's that. R squared is, if one over R is going to zero, uh, one over R zero squared is going to zero even faster. All right, so the physical interpretation here is that with this constant going to zero, it corresponds to uh, no interaction or negligible interaction. Now, physically, that makes sense. All right. Can you please stop talking over there, you guys? Your commentary is not as important as mine, so hush. All right. So physically, and, and so this whole idea of being able to add in an additive constant, one over R naught, um, and where you put R naught. See, this is the, here's your, for gravitational potential energy. This is important, right? If you do that, it makes physical sense. You could put any constant in there that you want. You know, you could put one over R zero equal to five inverse meters. You could put it equal to seven thousand inverse meters. All right. But if you put it to infinity, it makes a lot of physical sense, all right? Now, let's take a look at um, another factor. Um, and this is related to the idea of conservative and non-conservative. So let's go to page two here. 3.2. All right, and let's draw a central object, and we're going to, you know, object number two, we're going to put it on a circular orbit around, all right, so let's, and I'm not going to draw the other object, but we'll just, so let's call this capital R1. And let's put another circular orbit around it. Okay, and let's call this um, R2. So R2 is greater than R1. So we have two concentric circular orbits, all right? And I'm going to put, we're, we're going to do a closed path. We're going to do it. You know, last time we did um, two paths that were reverse, that were uh, related. And we're going to do a, a, a single closed path this time. So put a dot out here on your inner orbit somewhere. And then go straight out radially and put another dot. Okay. So this is part of your path. We'll make this an outward part of the path. Now go down here, a few degrees down, put another dot. Okay, and then go radially out from there and put another dot. Okay, so what our path, this one's going to be inward. All right, so let me draw it in blue. So let's say that this is our, dude, that's better. This is our closed path. All right, and let's remember that F is equal to minus GM1, M2 over R uh, times R hat. All right, and so let's give this a direction. Let's go outward here clockwise here, inward here, counterclockwise here. 
All right. Now, notice in the definition of the gravitational force, there's no angle dependence. So um, out here, let's label these points now. Uh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. All right. So from alpha to beta, uh, F is changing because you're changing R. Uh, but from beta to gamma, the force is uh, the magnitude of the force is uh, not changing. All right, now put a, put a generic dot out here somewhere on this outer curved surface. So let's call this point um, H. We use a, a Latin symbol for that one. Right now, at point H, uh, let's do a little sub diagram of H. Here's here's point H, and we're moving clockwise. So dr is in this direction, or d, we'll call it ds. So the chain, the increment of the path is in that direction. But what direction relative to that? is the gravitational force. It'll be perpendicular, right? So draw a right angle here. All right. Therefore, F dot DS uh, is equal to zero because they're perpendicular. Okay, so whatever the u integral is, I mean, in terms of you know writing it down and the coordinates and everything, it doesn't it doesn't do jack out here, all right? Because the force and the change in position are zero. Also, uh, let's do the, the the next part of the force, gamma two delta. Um, F is changing, so we, we have to do the integral. All right, so we got to do that one. All right. So we've got an outward integral, and we've got an inward integral. Okay. And then down here, we got a, from delta to alpha, um, the U integral is equal to zero again. Because um, the, the inward gravitational force is perpendicular to the path. Now, that's for this path. All right. All right, let's take a look at these integrals. Um, uh, the delta U on the path alpha beta is equal to minus of the integral of the force dr uh, from r alpha to r beta, all right? And you can calculate that if we had, you know, some number of meters and stuff and some masses, g we can look up. You could calculate that. Now let's take a look at this other one. This one we also have to do. U from gamma to delta, All right? So that's minus the integral from R uh, gamma to R delta um, of FDR, All right? Now, 
Is there any relationship between these two integrals? That is correct. In fact, R beta is equal to R gamma. And R uh, alpha is equal to R delta. So these two things are opposites. And therefore, the total change uh, on alpha, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, alpha, a closed path, um, delta u is zero. Exactly. All right. And for that, and that's a closed path. Now, the other angular variable, this is the, this is the key right here, that there's no angle dependence. All right. Now, we're going to be talking about something um, called, we're going to be talking, we've talked about momentum. We're going to be talking about angular momentum. And in a probably when we get back from break, um, an angular momentum is equal to the momentum in the theta direction. So if this is if this is theta, if this is the theta direction, like that, um, the it's the angular moment. It's the momentum associated with a path about a certain. Point and uh, and we're going to call it the ch the point that we're going to choose is the center of uh, mass one. So mass one could be like the Earth, and we're we're studying the Moon, you know. So this could be or we're studying the path of a spacecraft, you know, because they change orbits every once in a while, you know, depending. It's expensive to do it. You know, like the Hubble Space Telescope, they've changed its altitude any number of times. Same with the space station. I think it moves up and down a little bit. It's pretty expensive in terms of fuel, but they can do it. Now, the interesting thing here is um, the force does not have a, a component in the theta direction. All right. F has no theta uh, component. It's only radial. And for that reason, L, and I'll, I'll, I'll make it a vector here, angular momentum vector L is conserved as well. All right. And uh, so whatever, now that's a momentum. That's not an energy. That's a momentum. All right. And it's it's similar to the fact, go ahead and make a note of this to yourself. It's similar to the fact that the X component of the velocity is a constant. And the X component of the momentum, if we were calculating with VX, the X component of the momentum is just MVX. That's a constant if you're at the surface of the Earth. And why is that? Because there's no such thing as horizontal gravity, all right? And this is like saying, now, you know, just remember this. No such thing as a theta component in a gravitational force. Now, this has, this has, this has, um, this is related to the entire uh, use of symmetry and breaking symmetry in quantum field theory and uh, for quantum quantum systems. Uh, when you have something 
that doesn't have um, a force that doesn't have a certain uh, spatial dependence, then that means that that part of the motion is going to have a constant. And for this one, it's the orbital angular momentum. So this would be the orbital angular momentum. The magnitude of which is equal to MRV, you know, whatever that is. And we'll study that um, in a week or so after break. Question? Colby. What's that? Green's theorem? Oh, you mean from Calculus 3? Uh, yeah, it's related to that. Yeah, so... Yeah, we're we're trying to uh, there's there's a bunch of different Green's theorems that, and Green's functions, but yeah, it's it's related to that. Yeah, definitely. Good eyes. Um, now, all of this is to say that if this is the case, that you have a closed path. In fact, any closed path can be made up of a bunch of segments like these, either curves or um, radial components, you have a conservative force. In other words, total mechanical energy is defined and a constant. So E equals uh, PE plus KE. KE and PE are not, but... The sum of them is a constant, all right? So uh, is there a, do you, do you have a red pen? Yeah. Can I borrow your red pen? Thank you. All right. So here's your lesson. This is another condition for conservative forces or a conservative system if you don't have that you know like if you introduce in addition to gravitational field if you introduce the aerodynamic uh, drag force in the atmosphere then you got problems okay you're going to dissipate energy uh, but this is like out in space and you know if you go about mm, a few hundred miles up the space shuttle is about and the space station, they're about 200 miles or so up altitude-wise. They have, they can measure the atmosphere. There's still a little bit of atmosphere up there. They can actually measure it. It's very sparse. Um, but, you know, eventually you go out there, it's so, so small you can't measure it. And then you're in a situation like this where you only have the gravitational force, practically speaking. So you don't have to actually go to infinity to get um, only the gravitational field to worry about. You know, so, you know, like the moon is considered to have no atmosphere. It can't hold an atmosphere. It's too small at this part. Now, if we were further, if the moon were further out in the solar system where it's the ambient temperature from sunlight is a lot lower, then you could have atmosphere on something like the moon and it wouldn't be all barren. But right now it's too close to the sun, the ambient temperature from the solar uh, heat gain keeps the any atmosphere it might want to have uh, as a uh, uh, it's, it's too hot it'll escape it exceeds escape velocity from the surface of the moon and so even so like the Apollo astronauts you know when they launched back when they landed and when they launched back up to space to return home they uh, fired their rockets uh, to land and to and to um, to launch back out, all those gases are dissipated, okay, uh, because of the sun, basically because of sunlight. But you know, further out in space, this is it. And so, so this these are conserved. Now, there's all kinds of physics involved with changing orbits and stuff. You know, how do you minimize? Here's the other thing. You know, how do you minimize? the amount of energy that you have to expand to change orbits. And here's another one. 
How about elliptical orbits? This is circular orbits, cinchy. But try doing this with between two elliptical orbits. Oh, my goodness. Then you're talking trig out the wazoo. But that's what they do down in mission control. All right. Now, um, can you get me chapter eight on the screen there? All right. I want to work at, um, uh, I want the, that's it. That's what, can you uh, turn that towards me? All right, great. I want to do an example with you now. Um, three, five, 20, page three. Okay, we're going to do an example using something called the quartic um, potential. And this is in uh, chapter 8.2. Um, and so let's write down the quartic potential, uh, U of X. So we'll go back from space down here to Earth on the x-axis, uh, one-fourth C x to the fourth. This is a hugely important potential for all kinds of quantum mechanics problems. Now, this thing, in shape, it's going to look like this. It's going to look like a parabola, but it's going to be a little bit flatter at the bottom. Stay small. So it's not technically a parabola, but you can you can analyze it, you know, like a parabola. Now, for the example that we're working with, we're going to use uh, c equals eight newtons per meter cubed. All right. Now, let's say that, um, now this is the way the textbook uh, writers do it. They say it this way. It's total energy E um, at x equals zero uh, meters is uh, two joules. All right. Now, uh, this is the U axis. It's going to be in joules, and this is the X axis. So let's go up here. Let's go one, two. So let's say that this is two joules right there. All right. So just go up there and write a dotted line across. to symbolize the value of E. Okay, so that's equal to two joules. All right. And uh, the, the question is, find the positions. Where is the kinetic energy equal to zero? There's two of them. And then what are the forces there? Okay. Now, this is this uh, red horizontal line. That's a graph of the two joule uh, curve. It's a straight horizontal line. This is a graph of U. So let me make a bigger picture here. And that's a nice quartic. So let's say that this is two joules. Here's my red energy. It's just I'm just making a bigger picture. So there's total energy E. And at this point right here, uh, U is equal to E. All right? They intersect. 
all right? And what that means is that um, therefore, Ke is equal to zero there. Okay, so we got to figure out this point right here. And let's call that um, x1, all right? So uh, u of x1 is equal to two joules, all right? Now, uh, over here, this is a symmetric function versus left and right. So minus x1 is this baby out here. And u at minus x1 is also equal to 2 joules, OK, because they intersect. Because u intersects e. All right, so at that point, and also at this point, all right. Now down here, we know that u is equal to zero. So down here at the origin, you know, just put in x equals zero, one fourth times uh, eight newtons per cubic meter times zero to the fourth power is equal to zero. Uh, so that means that Ke right here is equal to two joules, all right? And because energy is conserved, um, even though the potential and the kinetic change, they both add up to um, two joules, no matter where you are. So some intermediate place like right here, um, you have a little bit of potential and a little bit of kinetic, all right? And you can figure it out if you know the, the position x, let's call this x2 over here. If you know what x2 is, you can work out um, u of x2 and then figure out kinetic energy. But out here at this, this point here and this point over here, um, the uh, potential energy is zero. Uh, or excuse me, the kinetic energy is equal to zero. All right. Down here, where x equals zero, kinetic energy is, is maximum, and it takes up all the, the total energy. All right, now let's figure out the location. And then we can get that from, from either one of these two babies. All right, so, um, so u of x1 equals 2 joules, and that's equal to 1 fourth times the quantity, 8. See how they're making it easy for you? Times uh, x1 squared. No, x1 to the fourth. All right, so there's your equation. So this is a plug-in situation. And the quotient here is 2. Uh, so I've got 2 joules equals 2. Uh, Newton per meter to the third times x1 to the fourth. Uh, so this is equal to, uh, let's write this down as, instead of two joules, let's write it as two Newton meters. Okay. And then I can cancel Newtons and I can cancel, no, I can't cancel meters. Uh, so let's see, I've got two meters equals two per cubic meter times x1 to the fourth. So x1 to the fourth is equal to one meter to the fourth. Okay, so the units work out good. Uh, this one's Cinchy, x1 is equal to one or um, uh, minus x1 is equal to minus one meter. All right, so there's your positions, all right? Now, this is not an oscillator potential, but it looks like an oscillator potential, and it will have oscillations uh, down here towards the minimum. You'll have small 
small perturbations, small oscillations. Anyways, so uh, Ke equals zero here. Now, what are the forces? Okay, let's work out the forces now. All right, the force uh, at position x is equal to minus d by dx of u of x. So that's equal to minus uh, cx to the threeth. All right. So f of one meter, f of x one, is equal to minus eight newtons per meter to the third. There's my c value, and then uh, one meter quantity to the third. So this is equal to minus eight newtons. All right, and notice that my minus sign here means left. So I could write it this way: f of x one is equal to minus 8 newtons quantity times i hat, all right? Similarly, f uh, of x2, or f of minus x1, the other side, it's equal to positive 8 newtons uh, times i hat, all right? So this is left. This is right. Okay, and that means it's a restoring force. Now, it's not a harmonic oscillator, but it's a restoring force. Okay. Now, let's say that you go... Um, let's, let's use this stuff to analyze... Results. Let's let's analyze something. Let's say that you start uh, x of zero equals zero point two five. No, let's let's say it's equal to one point zero meters. All right. So you're starting out here at x one, and let's say that v of zero. Well, v of zero has to be equal to one, equal to zero because the kinetic energy is equal to zero uh, meters per second, i.e. Ke is equal to zero, uh, zero joules. Okay, so you're holding it out there one meter out, right? So this is like saying, okay, hold it at 1.00 meter and then let go. All right, so let's figure out um, uh, at T, and let's say 0 0.1 seconds. All right, now we know the force here, as soon as you let go, you have a leftward force. So V of 0 0.1 Second is going to be, now we don't know what the size of it is because we don't have a, uh, an except, we don't, you know, we don't have a mass or anything, but it's going to be leftward, right? And an F will be smaller and it's still leftward, right? All right, now I'm going to go to the next page. So this is 3, 5, 20, page number 4. All right, so let's draw this again. Nice quad, uh, quartic. And here's one meter. Here's my 
here's my two joule energy uh, total mechanical energy curve and let's say that x of 0 equals x1 and that v of 0 of course is equal to 0 0 0.0 meters per second all right what's the kinetic energy out here at minus x1 so out here the kinetic energy is positive what is it zero all right all right so this thing's gonna so it starts toward uh, minus x1 gaining ke now once it passes the origin x equals zero out here the force is going to be to the right so it starts slow slows down after passing x equals zero right because to the left of zero the force is now rightward all right and you can calculate the force uh, using the gradient function or, or anything else you want to do all right so by the time it loses all speed by the time it gets to minus x1 all right so it starts with zip here it gains kinetic energy and on this side it loses ke you know because it's going to the left but it, it's going higher and higher up on the potential energy curve so it's getting more and more potential therefore less and less kinetic all right and here that it's it's out of kinetic energy it can't go any further to the left it's out of kinetic energy all right but then what happens What happens after it gets here? Now there's no friction in this system. We only have this potential energy function. What happens here? All the force is to the right now, over here on this whole left side of the board. Okay, so you start starts accelerating left. And what the Lord giveth, the Lord what the Lord taketh away, the Lord is giveth thing back. Regaining jewels of kinetic energy. Uh, where's the kinetic energy maximum? Sean. At the bottom. Eventually. Ke maxes out at two joules at x equals zero. All right. Now all of this is a fancy way of saying that these two points. I'm going to put little sparklies around them. These two points here uh, are turning points. in the motion all right and that is uh 
The turning points of the motion depend on initial conditions. Um, so for instance, uh, X of zero equal to one meter is equivalent to saying that um, the total energy is equal to two joules. Okay, so if you know if you know either one of these, you know that that you know at least even if you even if you start somewhere else, I mean you could start here. Actually, that's a good question. What if you start? Uh, at 0 0.2 meters with total mechanical energy equals 2 joules still, right? So if you start right about there, right, at, two, at 0 0.2 meters, what happens then? What's going to happen to it? Is it going to have some kinetic energy? I'm saying that under this condition, energy of two joules, initial position 0 0.2, what does that tell you about kinetic and potential energies if you start here? You got some of both. You have a little bit of both. Okay, so you have some Ke and you have some potential energy. It, so you got a little bit of each. You can calculate it out. Now, that's all that tells you. What don't you know? So you've got some motion here at, at, at uh, 0 0.2 meters. What don't you know for the initial condition? I mean, you can figure that out if you have the mass of the object. What don't you know? If, if this is all you know, you know, you've got some Ke, you can calculate that. you got some potential energy, you can calculate that. You know the, the total energy is 2 joules. Uh, what don't you know, uh, Julian? Yeah, you don't know which direction. All right. So you still need, uh, so V of 0 is unknown. Uh, unless you specify, unless you also know that. So if you know the initial velocity is, or the initial speed is less than zero or greater than zero, then you know the direction. When And then after that, you can figure out, all right, if I'm going to the right, this is my first turning point. If I'm going to the left, this is my first turning point. But then after that, you just cycle back and forth, back and forth, all right? So it is possible to start at somewhere in between. But, you know, it's a little bit more work, but you can figure it out. And you can figure out, so you can get X of T, and you can get X of T over here. X of T is pretty easy. Well, I shouldn't say that for a harmonic oscillator potential. You know, if you had one half kx squared up here, it'd be easy. It's just sines and cosines. This one, I don't know what this. Do you know what the solution is for this, for a quartic potential? You could do it. No, you could do it. Um, you could do it. Uh, what do you call it? Numerically with a spreadsheet and stuff. Hmm. That might make a nice homework assignment. If I was mean, but. I try not to be mean. Now, I want to go back to the display. Turn me on to the laptop, please. And let's do another. I want you to think. Um, about the following question. Oops. All right. Uh, go ahead and make. No. <laughs> I forgot to animate it. Okay. 
Uh, we're gonna do the. We're gonna do this. Go ahead and make notes. Are there any turning points if e is great is less than zero? You can have less than zero. Uh, in your gravitational potential energy system. But there's only one turning point. Now, and we'll get to that in a second, so just make a note of that. Well, I won't even ask it. Uh, but I, I do want to uh, go and tackle the gravitational potential energy. Um, and we'll just take a look at this real quick. So here we go. Can you switch me over to the dot can, please? So two, no, three, five, twenty. This is page five. All right. Now uh, U of R is equal to minus G M one M two over R. That's our function of position uh, from a few pages ago, okay? And uh, the limit of U of R as R goes to infinity is equal to zero from below, from the negatives, all right? Now, this is just a hyperbola. All right, so on a, and we're just going to go positive values of R. Uh, so here's the U of R axis. And uh, here's zero. All right, and so this is a, an upside down hyperbola, and it's going to, it's going to come into the zero or the into the r axis from below so this is asymptotically going to zero from below now it's a hyperbola so it's going to it's going to spike down here so basically Let me do that in, uh, in blue. Trace over this in blue. All right. So here's your U of R graph. All right. Now, if um, if E is less than, if total mechanical energy is uh, less than zero, it's negative. Um, just draw it somewhere down here. So just kind of anything down here, you know, kind of an intermediate. So E is like equal to negative five joules, say. Now that would be for a very, very small, that's very small object. Usually, you know, planets, you know, the earth around the sun and stuff like that. Uh, Let's go to this page here. Um, we got a problem here because here's the turning point. And there's only one. But you don't know until you have the initial conditions, you don't know if you're climbing out of this potential. This is what we call a potential well, by the way. And it just keeps going down. So um, this one keeps going asymptotically to zero out here. And this one goes asymptotically to infinity. So U of R, the limit as R goes to zero is equal to infinity, negative infinity. All right, so, so sideways eight. 
Um, now, the difference between the total energy curve and your potential energy curve is this. So all this stuff down here is your kinetic energy, all right? All right. Now, what's the problem with that one turning point? I mean, physically, gravitational system, one turning point. You got kinetic energy, you know, it's however much energy you have minus however much the potential energy is. So you've got some positive Ke here. As long as the energy curve is above the potential energy curve, you've got some kinetic. Right? So everywhere I darkened in, you've got kinetic. In fact, it's going to infinite kinetic energy as R goes to zero. But what's the physical problem with that? I mean, gravity, astronomically speaking, what's, what's, a, what's the problem with this? Think. Think about our solar system. Think about our own home planet. Well, for most of you, it's our home planet. I don't know about uh, so. Oh, so you're you're admitting you're from another planet? Yeah, you just well, the students just went like this over here. Uh, Alex, what did you, question? Right. So what would that mean in terms of the solar system? In terms of the solar system, what would that physically correspond to? Huh? Yeah. So this co corresponds to a collision eventually you know, depending on your initial conditions, you know, but eventually you're, you're either, if you're, if your initial velocity is negative inward, it's going to stay negative and you're just going to smash into the sun. Okay. Now we got stuff doing that. If your initial velocity is outward, you're going to go out to some turning point radius, um, radial distance, and then you're going to turn around and go back in, and then you're going to smush into the sun, All right? Now, we got stuff to do it that does that. You know, sometimes we see comets, you know, and asteroids plunge into the sun. But the problem with that is how do you, from this potential energy, how the heck do you get a circular orbit or an elliptical orbit, you know, because, you know, the, the, all the planets are on elliptical orbits. They're close to circles, but they're actually, Mars is especially elliptical. Mercury is fairly elliptical. The comet's way elliptical. Asteroids sometimes too. You know, near-Earth atmosphere, near-Earth uh, asteroids, big disaster, they sometimes come in on, if they were on a, if they were near Earth, and on a circular orbit, we wouldn't have to worry about it because they're orbiting just behind us or in front of us. But if they're on an elliptical orbit that crosses our orbit, you know, we got a tr we got problems with that. But how the heck, how do you get an elliptical orbit out of this? Yeah, multiple foci for an ellipse. That's true. That's geometry class. Physically. Let me ask you a question. Cecilia and everybody else. If you're plunging straight into the sun, straight in, right on a radial path, uh, do you have any angular momentum? No, you don't. So here's the cool part. 
if you have angular momentum, if the planet, etc., has some L, some angular momentum, it's conserved. And it corresponds to some unlosable kinetic energy. All right? And so what happened what ends up happening is you have a slight when you when you put that into, that goes into it's unlosable. It's part of the conserved energy, all right? Because there is no such thing as as sideways gravity. So if you've got some angular momentum, you ain't gonna lose it. And because that's motion that you ain't gonna lose. You're always going to have some connect. It's kind of like, you know, in a projectile motion, you always have some VX. If it's not a straight pop-up, you're going to have some VX. So at the top of the motion, you're going to have some kinetic energy from only the horizontal component of the motion. Same thing here. So now the way this works, let's draw a And we'll call this U prime of R. Now, that's not a derivative. That's just a variation or an or a alternative version of the potential energy. So now I'm going to lightly trace in my hyperbola or my, yeah, my hyperbola. Okay. So there's my normal uh, U of R. But now if you incorporate angular momentum, here's what you get. A dip and then eventually going out asymptotically to zero. Now, let me write that in blue. All right. Okay, so this is U prime of R. And let me, I'll make this a dotted. I'll make that a dotted line. So here's your. This dotted line is your normal, you know, the curve that we have up here, U of R. This is your modified one, incorporating more of the physics, okay? And now you can see that you have a global minimum right here. Now, to, uh, draw in your red total energy, right? So this is minus 5 joules or something. or five terajoules or whatever it happens to be. Now, if you have some angular moments, something that puts you on an orbit, look at what you got. You got two turning points. There they are. And there's the variation. All right, so... There we are. Now notice that one of them is fairly small, a small value of R, and this one is a bigger value of R. And guess what we call that? Apogee or aphelion, if it's the sun. If this were an Earth satellite, that would be called apogee, the furthest point away. This would be? perihelion for a solar for a solar orbit all right so this whole idea and here's your oscillator i mean here's the here's a, a minimum and you've got close to harmonic oscillation down here all right now guess what um
how do you get a, a circular orbit here? How do you get a circular orbit? Circular orbit would be if you had energy right here at the minimum. In that state, you only have one R, one radial value, and it's stable, and that means you're at a circle at this energy, this lower energy down here. So something a little bit lower, like minus 20 or something like that, you'll find low energy orbit, and it's circular, all right? Now, um, so these two correspond to an elliptical. Now, deducing the formula for an ellipse from this requires enough calculus to choke a mule. All right, so you guys won't have to worry about that. But for but looking at this picture, and that is why looking at these curves is important. If you can graph it out, you can figure out a lot of stuff, like perihelion and apihelion. All right? Or you can figure out, oh, I only got one. Stable orbit. Now, this certainly occurs. This this definitely is realistic. And But this is also realistic, too. And we see a lot of these, you know. Most of the stuff in the or in this solar system has already plunged into the sun. Okay. So another way to think about it is, you know, we've got these these we we now have spacecraft that are out there obs uh, uh, observing the sun, and they're in a in a constant orb constant radial orbit, um, or maybe they're trying to stay uh, synchronized with Earth, so they're basically on our orbit. And but if you if you took a BB gun or a, a, a pea shooter or something and aimed it straight at the sun, that would be like this. All right. But if you if you took the BB gun or the, or the, the pea shooter and aim kind of sideways from, you know, so if you're looking at the sun and you, you dip a little bit to the right or left then you're talking about something like this. All right. All right, now, can you switch me back over to laptop? All right, so that's our little uh, reinforcement concerning elliptical point, uh, uh, turning points on an elliptical orbit. All right, now, I have a homework assignment for you. And the homework assignment is no homework. You're dismissed. Have a great spring break. I'll see you in a couple Two Tuesdays from now. I know this is going to make everybody sad. No homework for spring break. Oh, Dr. B. All right, let's get this stuff. Now, I'll grade this stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't have those with me today. I'll try to bring him next to two Tuesdays from now. I was looking for you yesterday, uh, Tuesday, but Josh. Since like a natural formula in the beginning, the one that was on the board didn't have a negative in the equation, but it's all on the outside. Wouldn't all of our answers be flipped around since you added the negative? Yeah, it's tricky. I always have to work it out. I work it out so that my integral makes sense physically. And that's what we did. You know, we talked about, okay, if it's coming inward, it's going to be gaining kinetic, yeah, like losing a, potential. Yeah, like a, if it's going outward, it's going to be gaining potential. And even the, the, the potential energy function here at the surface of the Earth, which is definitely different for a small, you know, for our thin atmosphere, basically. Um, even that, you know, you gain potential on the way up, lose it on the way down. So, you know, it, it's... Um, the magnitude is gm1 m2 over r squared, but in that formula, it's it's an f dot ds formula. So and so you got to figure out. And so that's what the minus sign was.
Yeah, but okay. I was just saying, like, when you're creating the call for Gibby for that, because we didn't have that. Don't worry about that. Oh, Don't worry about that. All right, I'm, I'm pretty merciful on homework, usually. I just put in my grade for this in my courses, and I have a grade here, so I just want to know. Let me see that, Justin. Yeah, you were one of these. What was that on uh, Khan Academy or something like that?